It is my great privilege to uh, introduce a former U.S. Congressman and American hero, Randy Cunningham. Thanks. Lost a good friend here. Just found out. Uh, anyway, I want to thank you for coming. I feel right at home. My mom and dad grew up in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and I've got a lot of cousins around Tecumseh, so I guess I got a little red clay in my blood uh, from Oklahoma. The only time that I fought against Oklahoma is I went to MU. And in the Big A, Kansas and Oklahoma were our two big rivals and so on. But thank you for coming out. Uh, it's beautiful driving through here, a lot of big farms and stuff. But I'm surrounded with aviation, with uh, Air Force pukes all around here. Not many Navy guys there. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to, at the end of this, I'm going to open it up to questions. And anything you want to ask is, uh, is fair game. When I got in trouble, when I got, you know, when I was in Vietnam, anything you have that you want to ask, I'll try and answer for you like that. First of all, I want to tell you about a little humility. I actually got shot down twice. And the, first, the second time was I came back from Vietnam and I was in New York. And I was on the Johnny Carson show. I was on Barbara Walters show. Uh, that night, I had dinner at Club 21 with Van Johnson, uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, and a couple other guys at Club 21. And when I was coming back on an airplane, I had my ice cream suit on. And as I went up the gangplank, the, we call them stewardesses and the flight attendants. The uh, stewardess, she looked at me and she said, you went to University of Missouri, didn't you? And I remember thinking, she knows who I am. She said, I'm going to get lucky when I get to San Diego. <laughs> and so I went back and I kept expecting her to bring me a drink or come back and say hi. And she didn't. As we pulled into San Diego, I waited and I got off kind of last one on the airplane. And I said, ma'am, you know I went to the University of Missouri? She said, yeah. I said, you saw me in Johnny Carson? No. Barbara Walters? No. The Today Show? No. I said, how did you know that I went to the University of Missouri? She said, I saw her on your ring walking up the, the gangplank uh, as you were picking your nose. True <laughs> 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 story. I never got off an airplane so fast in my life. <laughs> That's the second time I really got shot down. <laughs> oh, is the mic better? No. Uh, I've got a bunch of things here. I've got so many stories I can tell you, but uh, I want to thank uh, the people here at the museum, Lane and Jason and Eric and Barb, your wife, and everybody. And we went out to dinner last night but with this beautiful lady here. She's a young pilot, too. And uh, Jason's wife. And uh, we had a wonderful time, but I wrote some things down here. If you need other stories, that uh, I'll do that. Uh, I'm going to start it off that three months ago, 12 Vietnamese pilots uh, came into San Diego, and a bunch of us that had flown against them met with them in San Diego. And one of the guys is the guy that I had shot down and killed up, the only guy that made it up. Kind of interesting talking to him. And I met uh, Nguyen Van Bay, who was their top ace. He flew mid-17s. And one day, as I came off target, I looked up and I started just a thought away from squeezing the trigger on him. And I had tracers coming up on my cockpit, so I had to break off. That was Nguyen Van Bay. <laughs> he, he said, yeah, I saw you go by. And he thought that was the only time I came close to getting shot down. But as we talked to these pilots, it was interesting. I will have a hard time forgiving the guards that uh, beat up and tortured our POWs. But these guys are like we were. They were flying for their country. They weren't into the torture and stuff. And we got to, when I left, I had 12 new good friends. But one of the guys I shot down on that day uh, was a young pilot, and, but he was very good. He flew his airplane 
well. And I asked the 12 pilots, I said, when, when you go back home, will you tell his parents, you know, how, what a good pilot he was? He died, but he died for his country, and he, you know, he died well. Well, they sent me a picture just last month, and eight of them went to his grave and spoke those words. And then they went to his family, and this September, I'm going back over to Vietnam. Uh, his family's invited me to come and meet with him. Wow. And so I think that will be a good thing. Uh, they wanted me to first, since this is a MiG-21, to talk about a MiG the very first thing. Uh, on 19 January 1972, if you remember, we weren't allowed to go over North Vietnam. Uh, Johnson, President Johnson stopped us going over North Vietnam in 1968. This is 1972 in January. And we would hit Magia and Van Karai and Van Nappy Passage where the VC were bringing supplies and running them in the south and coming down uh, south against our troops. And we weren't allowed, as we would bomb them on the Laotian side, the North Vietnamese would shoot at us with SAMs and AAA and knock us down. We couldn't touch them. And uh, a lot of us said, hey, that's not really fair. That's not cricket. You know, we can't hit these guys. Now, I was a lieutenant junior grade. I didn't do any of the decisions at that time. I just flew. I was a junior pilot in the squadron. And uh, I happened to be on a mission. And the mission was called a protective reaction strike that we sent uh, photo reconnaissance over Quang Lang Airfield because they'd been launching MiG-21s out of there after our B-52s. And so we were going to go over there and we sent the photo reconnaissance airplane over because the new rule said if they shoot at you, you can hit them at that time. You can't go back to Tonsonu Air Force or you can't come off the carrier Navy, but you can go and strike them at that time. So we knew that the photo bird, the wrecking the F-8 RA-5s, would get shot at, and we just so happened to have 35 airplanes <laughs> right there in Laos outside uh, Quang Lang. Well, we went over, and I have a tape uh, that Justin, that we're, uh, we were going to play it, but if you ever want to hear what combat is really like, we had 18 SAMs fired at us in pairs, 36 of them. And uh, this is the flight where I flew right over the base, I had mid-cap that day, and I was supposed to position myself between the striker and the mid bases. And as soon as I got over Coin Lang, I had a pair of sands shot at me from the left, and so I broke to the left. They told us four Gs will be the same, and I guarantee you eight does. You know? <laughs> but it, it costs you a lot of airspeed when you do that. And as soon as I went belly up, they fired two more at us from the belly side. So I reversed and broke into those, and there was 18 of them fired, not just against me, but against the striker in pairs. And so I had my nose down, uh, just trying to accelerate. We had the airplane unloaded, get it back, and I picked up about 550 knots. And I looked out, and there were two A7s moving outside of the field. And I closed, and I looked, and I said, A7s don't have afterburn. And I looked and I got closer, and about 100 feet above the ground were two beautiful MiG-21s. And I closed the MiGs uh, and came down on top of them, and they were down in the treetops, and I was below the treetops. Now, I can't talk without my hands, so <laughs> don't go away. But as I closed down on these guys, the leader was here and the wingman here, and I came about 50 feet just, and I had about 700 knots now, and the trees were going by pretty quick. And I fired, and I know that he could not have seen me because I'm dead six o'clock, his, his flight leader must have seen it. Well, he broke into me, and I could see the vapor coming off the wing. And uh, I fired, and the missile came off and went here, and couldn't handle the turn. And I did a roll over the top, and I'd never done a roll like that at 50 feet above the ground. It scared the hell out of me, because I got like this, and I saw the ground, and I whipped it. He just dropped his wing, and I fired, and by the time the missile came off, it was dead 6 o'clock, and he tumbled into that thing. I think the thing noteworthy about that, I played when I got back from my squadron mates, 
the tape, the audio tape, which uh, Justin has, and we're going to play it, but we can't get a tape machine to play it here. And uh, my bad, I forgot to bring my tape machine, he didn't have one. But in the thing, as just as I shot, you hear on the tape, I call stand by, stand by, Fox 2, off away. What does that mean? When I was an ensign, and we had our first missile shot in a fiery drone, you had a wingman, or a flight instructor, I was just a student, and you're going out and shoot a drone that's airborne, you're gonna shoot Sidewinder and Sparrow at it. Well, as you get behind the drone as it's turning, you call standby, standby, that lets your instructor know that you're about ready to shoot, that you have the target. You call hot shot to pop the flares on the drone so the Sidewinder will see it. You call Fox 2 when you squeeze the trigger up away when the missile goes, and all of these things, and then you call Bula Bula when, when, if you hit the drone. Well, on the tape, behind the MiG-21, I go standby, standby, Fox 2, up away. I didn't have to call Hot Shot because he was already in the burn. But he went down and I said, guys, you fight like you train. And guys used to talk about, yeah, let's go up and Fire, shoot, fire me so we can get back to happy hour. And I treated every engagement like that, whether it was against another pilot or against a drone, like I was actually fighting uh, a MiG, and it paid off with this thing. Well, we came back, and I chased the second MiG. He just took off running, and uh, I squeezed the trigger, went to Sparrow, and we had a, only a 7% kill probability with Sparrow. Uh, we have 49% with Sidewinder, the heat seeker. And I squeezed the trigger and nothing came off. And uh, we found there was a short ejector cartridge that didn't go. But I chased that sucker. I would have chased him into China. And my backseater, Willie Driscoll, and Chuck the Bell, you make it here? Chuck didn't get it. But anyway, uh, Chuck's a good friend. He's an Air Force Q uh, friend of mine. But. Um, the missile didn't come off, and my backseater said, Duke, what's your fuel state? And I said, we got five, 5,000 pounds. I had to go clear back, almost from Hanoi, down to the ship, the carrier, the Connie. And so I, start, I started screaming, I said, I want Texaco, which is a tanker. And they said, Texaco is in up. The guys tried to plug it and get fuel, and I said, let me try. I went up and plugged into it, and the fuel came back just like nectar and I chopped off and went back to the ship. I did not want to go to an Air Force base and land. They would have painted my airplane with every squadron picture they had on it. <laughs> but we got back aboard the ship and no MiG had been shot down uh, in almost two years. We hadn't been going up north. And so Captain James C. Ward, the skipper of the county, stopped the ship after we landed. We were the last one to land and brought us up uh, brought all 5,000 guys on the flight deck, brought us up to, to witnesses. And I remember taxiing in and folding the wings. Uh, I got to, you know, trying to get the switches safe so the missiles aren't going to fire and stuff. And my plane captain, Willie Lincoln White, African American, plane captain and also worked Cordy's, he broke through the crowd. He knocked over Admiral Cooper. You don't do that, but maybe, okay. He was so excited, he ran up on the port wing and jumped up on the port wing. You Air Force pukes, that's the left wing. <laughs> okay. But he jumped up on the wing, and he, I'm just trying to get the ejection seat pin in. And he grabbed me by the arm, and he said, Lieutenant Cunningham, Lieutenant Cunningham, we got our MiG today, didn't we? What was Willie telling me? That all... 5,000 of those guys deserve credit for that airplane. From Willie Lincoln White that put the missiles up there, to Ramirez, my Filipino cook that fixed my double egg, double cheese, double fry burger every night, <laughs> on night ops, to those guys. You can't operate without those guys working on your airplane. If you can imagine getting behind an airplane and you squeeze the trigger and nothing comes off or you get up and the engine fails, or you have a hydraulic failure. So the people that you work with, especially you around here, that I know a lot of you are working on these old airplanes and stuff, thank the guys that fix these airplanes for you. They keep you alive. And they're the reason that Willie and I were 
so successful. 8 May 1972, a few months later, our target was a driver's training park in North Vietnam, uh, just, just a little bit north of Vin. And that's where they were training these Vietnamese to drive trucks of ordnance and stuff to drive them across. And they had hundreds of trucks there, and that was our target. Well, I had a big cap that day. And so uh, we were to position ourselves between Yen Bai and uh, Hanoi to pick up anything that was coming after our strike. We had about 35 airplanes in the strike group. And I pushed across the target, and it was overcast, except for the mountains you could see a little bit there. And we got about 15 miles north, uh, west of that, northeast, and uh, the flight controller, Red Crown, called up and, and said showtime, which was our call sign. You've got two bandits at uh, 12 o'clock, 30 miles. You know, 30 miles, you're traveling at uh, 10 miles a minute. And that's just your speed. If they're flying at that, saying you're, you're closing at 60 miles a minute, and that that's, happens pretty quick in a jet. So we I told my wingman, Brian Grant, I said, light him up. So we accelerated, and the controller was calling these MiGs at 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 15 miles. I couldn't get a radar lock with Sparrow, and all of a sudden they disappeared off the radar. And I told my wingman they'd gone low, it, but there was an overcast, and you couldn't see. So I put the thing into a climb and called across. And when I figured that they had gone by us, I called a cross turn. And I was high like this, Brian was low, and he ended up with a mid-17 at a 6 o'clock turning. And I came back around, and uh, as I came back around, two more mix flew right over the top of me. And I figured, my wingman's going that way, he's being chased by a mix. They're going that way, they're out of the fight for a second. But they turned inside of each other and came down behind us. The one mix was at about 70 degrees, which our missiles had to be about 40 degrees but he was getting close to Brian, so I shot just to scare him, and he actually turned. The missile went by him, and he came off of Brian, and he knew that the missile came from here, but why did he turn right where the missile came from? I never figure out, but he turned, and I shot the second missile. He blew up, but at that time, those two MiGs, I had tracers coming by my right side, so I went this way, and I had tracers coming by the left side, and if I go up, he's going to rendezvous on me. So I rolled the airplane, put 12 Gs instantaneous, not so you can't sustain 12 Gs, but I put 12 Gs on the airplane and he rendezvoused on me. And so I went into the clouds and lost him. And I never did see him again, but two Air Force guys, I think, shot down two big 17s up by Yen Bai. And I hope it's the same son of a gun that was shooting me that <laughs> they knocked down. So that was the 8th May. 10 May 1972, two days later, uh, I was, I looked at the flight schedule and I went on it and they're going right down at Haikong Railroad Yard just south of Hanoi. And I called the skipper and I said, Skipper, we're short of fighter. And Kag has his airplane down in the hangar bay getting spit shine for his change of command in a couple of days. And he said, well, go talk to Kag. Gus Eggert, really a nice guy. And I went to CAG and I said, CAG, I want to go on this flight and the only airplane available is yours down getting spit shine. He said, well, Duke, if you can get it up out of the hangar, get it fueled, get the missiles on it, this was like two hours before launch. And you can do it. Well, I knew the maintenance guys. They got the airplane, got the missiles on there, got it fueled and stuff. But as I launched, the strike group had already, I couldn't even see them. They were already heading toward the target. And so it actually was a big boom for me because the tanker was circling at 16,000 feet. I went up and I was climbing and I called the tanker to head toward the strike group. And so I plugged into him and he gave me extra fuel all the way to when I turned in to go feet drive. So I had a full fuel tank at altitude uh, as I got to the, the ingress period. And as I went in, uh, they hit the strike group. My target was a railroad yard, and I came off the target like this, and my, my wingman again, Brian Grant, said, Duke, big 17 at 7 o'clock. 
And I had just told Willie, I said, Willie, look at that military target we just hit because it decimated it just at the railroad yard. And I looked like this, and I had tracers coming by. And a MiG-17 had his nose about 40 degrees down. Now, those of you that know about a MiG-17, he doesn't have hydraulically boosted controls. And at 450 knots, he has a hard time moving that sticks like a piece of iron to turn it. And so I started to break, and I said, I did that two days ago, and the guy turned on me. But this and then I said, he's going too fast. So I broke into him. As soon as I saw the overshoot coming, his wingman went straight vertical. And now you're looking, can I get from here to here before this guy can get to me? And that comes from your training when you're you know, fighting against adversary airplanes, a top gun, and Air Force aggressor squadron and stuff. You fight like you train. So as he reversed, I squeezed the trigger and he blew up. The key to that was, I flew with a different wingman down around Anlock, which was way south before this. And as I came off target with bombs, we had 142 mils in for Mark 82 bombs. And you set 35 mils to align your gun sight with your, with your missiles. And I called set 30, you know, 32 mils, 35 mils, uh, go uh, labs ready direct. That means you go labs ready direct, and all you have to do is hit the pickle to get rid of your center line and your external stores and go to arm. And he came back and he said, dude, what the hell are you doing? We're down, there's no mix, you know, 300 miles away from the MiG bases. I told him, I said, when the MiGs come off, I want to be able to, you know, have everything set. On 10 Bay, when I came off that target, as soon as I started, I released, I went labs, ready, direct, so 35 mils went to arm. And you think, as this guy broke into me after shooting tracers at me, that I could have reversed like this and gone through four switches, rolled in 35 mils, put out my Benson and hedges, and squeezed the trigger. No way. So, you know, I key and I told these young guys, I said, every flight that you have, I don't care if you're just a student pilot or whatever, everything that you do, whether it's instrument training or whatever it is, you treat it like an emergency or that you're going to have to do that. And when the time comes and you do have a, a shot or something, you're going to take it. Well, that was on 8 May. Um, 10 May, I don't know if I'll even get into 10 May. That's when we shot three. It takes too long. That's when we shot three minutes down. Um, that's the first kill of 10 May. The second kill was, as I came off that, uh, shot him. I accelerated, did a... a I still had the full inner side, just got rid of my center line and a vertical pull up, blew it, so I had full internal fuel. And there were MiGs all over the sky, so I said, I'm not going back to the carrier yet, there's more MiGs out there. And I came and there was a defensive wheel, MiG-17, MiG-17, MiG-17. And in that wheel, in that circle picture, like a, a, a wagon rolled up, there was two Navy F-4s. You don't get in turning fight with mix and like that, but one of them was my XO, Dwight Tim. And he came out of that MiG, and he turned in front of me like this, and the MiG chasing him, I came and I just started to squeeze the trigger, and the second Phantom, which I didn't see, if he had had another coat of paint on, I would have hit it. I mean, his, his filled my windscreen like this, and I went through each jet works, <laughs> And the XO went out, so I went blowing straight through. Came back and got in behind the MiG. We had the XO and the MiG here. Uh, if he's right here, he had a MiG-17 here. He had a single MiG-21 here, and he had a MiG-17 here that he didn't see. And I was too many angles. If When you listen to this tape on 10 May, I scream at him to reverse starboard because I'm too many angles. And every time I turned in this way, I had four MiG-17s and four MiG-21s above us, and, and they would come down and shoot at me. And I couldn't get him to turn because I couldn't take the MiG off of him. And plus, if I shot a Sidewinder, the Phantom had a much hotter engine, and the Sidewinder could kill my wingman instead of the MiG. So we had a maneuver called, you know, reverse starboard, which was called to reverse like this, 
and turn down. Now the MIG is, is like this. So you can imagine as you turn like this and you reverse and you're taking your tailpipe away from him, he look what he's doing. He's turning his tail right to me. And finally, <laughs> I screamed it three times and I finally said, if you don't go starboard, you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. And he went starboard. And so I shot and the, the MIG actually blew up pretty close to him. He saw the, the full explosion go off. And as we did that, the MIG-21s rolled in on him. And I thought, man, here comes, you know, I've got two more missiles left. And here came the MiG-21s like this, but then they knew I was there and they reversed like this and went and hauled. And I said, okay, that's two kills, that's enough, I'm out of here. And I headed toward the beach and uh, I saw a single MiG-21, I'm sorry, a MiG-17 coming at us at about three miles away. And I said, Willie? Here comes a MiG. We didn't see anybody else around us at that time. And I said, watch this. I'm going to use one bad. There any kids in here? I'm going to use one bad word. I said, I'm going to scare the shit out of this MiG. <laughs> and uh, in training, we had to pass with 200 feet lateral separation in training so that we didn't have impact head on us. And I used to, as a student, try to take the paint off the instructor's face He'd be right below average to cutting him, and I already had 40 degrees turn on him. And so it worked. And so I started to press this guy just like I had in training, and all of a sudden his guns lit up. I forgot he had guns in him. I never had a <laughs> tail shooting at me, and it scared me. So I went vertical like this, and I went vertical coming because I knew he couldn't stay with me vertical that I was going to come back like this and every big that we'd ever seen that didn't have an advantage ran. And Hanoi was that way and I made a big mistake and I expected, assumed that he was going to run. And I came like that and that's where on the tape some of you have seen, instead of going vertical like this, we came and we're canopy to canopy about from here to the parking lot. And that's where I looked in and saw a little set of Gomer gargles, a little Gomer scarf on his head. And we're looking eye to eye. That gets your attention. And so I went over the top, and I was out zooming him, but I went like this on the turn, and he shot. I made another mistake. I gave him a predictable flight path. And so I dropped the nose, and he came in, and I picked up 500 knots like this, and I broke into him. He did overshoot. And I remember thinking, you're dead, you little communist SOB. And turned and kicked my rudder like this, did a rudder reversal turn and came down on him, and I, I remember just thinking, okay, go a little farther and I'm going to shoot you. And then he broke into me, and I overshot him. He did a rudder reversal and came down. We did two of those, and that cost you a lot of speed doing that, pulling all those Gs. And so I got away from him, and I had a guy named Dave Frost, I'm going to regress again, who, when I was a Lieutenant J.G., I guess my first Top Gun student flying simulated tactics. I went out and I beat uh, my, they say you can't beat a Top Gun pilot when you're a student. Well, I shot him with Sidewinder, I shot him with a Sparrow, and I shot him closed and good guns on him. We went below the deck. That's one of the parts of the movie that I got in trouble for is killing him, but I said he's dead. And uh, I came back pretty proud that, you know, I shot a Top Gun instructor. I split off from him, which you're not supposed to do. I came blowing by the tower, spilled coffee all over a guy, and I got in trouble. I didn't have to go see the base commander. I had to go see Admiral Walker in Commander Pack, Vice Admiral. And he chewed my butt out royally. He used to introduce me at fundraisers and remind people he's the Admiral that chewed my butt out, you know, for doing bad things. But the second guy I flew against it was a guy named Dave Frost, now Admiral Frost. And I started off with him and the same thing. Started off behind him, we went vertical like this, came back around, instead of me having advantage, advantage, it was disadvantage, disadvantage. And I'm going pure vertical like this, and he's still chasing me. And he said, okay, Duke, roll, put your lift vector on me. Use one G of gravity and pull. If I early turn you, go out my belly, if I stay here like this, go and unload. Well, he early turned, so I went this way. I had the nose buried too deep. He said, okay, 
you're going to give me the altitude to accelerate to catch you and kill you. He said, hold top rudder, unload the airplane because I was arcing. Go zero G to go like this, hold top rudder. He was flying my airplane for him. He decided to teach his cocky lieutenant something uh, instead of just shoot me and coming back and say, hey, I, I shot down Duke Cunningham in training, this cocky lieutenant JG. But 10 May, 72, with this MiG, I'm sitting like this, pure vertical, he's below me. I hear Frosty, put your belt lift vector on him, dude. Pull, he early turned me, I went out like this, and I said, don't get the nose low, hold top rudder, unload, and accelerate, and came back and fought against, against it. This time, coming back at him, since I had out accelerated him, we're coming like this, and he, I saw his nose lift just a little bit. And what I did is I came back on the throttle, went to idle, dropped the speed brakes, and dropped the flaps, half flap, and he went out in front of me. Now, I, another mistake I made, I expected that MiG to keep going with a relative motion, but he ran out of speed, and I was too close. I was only about 800, 700, 800 feet behind him. If I'd had a gun, I could have blown him out, but Sidewinder wouldn't arm at that range. Although at that time, he went like this and he departed his airplane. And so I went and said, if he's going to run, I'm not going to. And in the dive, I got, and we got up to pretty high speed going down, and I shot about 60 degrees nose down after him, and he didn't make it out. That was the third kill that day. So I thought, man, this is great. I just shot down my fifth me. I'm going to go back uh, to the ship and be happy as a lark, and I'll have a margarita. And uh, it didn't work that way. On the way out, uh, we heard a call called Sam, Sam, Nam Den. Nam Den was a city that was right here. And I looked over, and I saw an SA-2 coming. It, about, it ended up coming as we're going about 3 o'clock. And I just started to break into it, and it's lucky I didn't. I was late because it went off and hit the bottom of the airplane. If I had rolled this way, that shrapnel would have gone through and hit Billy and I blow. So it sounded like somebody took a thousand BBs and threw against the airplane. And so I, I looked at all my instruments, everything looked good, and so I put it into a climb. I got up to about 30,000 feet, and the airplane started yawing, and I looked at the hydraulics, and my PC-1, which is my primary hydraulics, was zero. PC-2 was fluctuating utility, which controlled the rudders. I had that, but it was lower than it should be like this. And at that same time, Willie said, Duke, it's getting hot back here. I looked through the mirrors, and there's about a 40 degree, 40-foot uh, flame of <laughs> fuel burning behind us. And we're still 40 miles over North Vietnam. And I remember thinking that any time, like maybe some of you, any time you got in trouble, you ask for God's help. That's the only time I ever talked to God is when I got in trouble. And I remember thinking, God, the airplane went upside down. I said, God, get my butt out of here. I don't want to die. I don't want to be a POW. And I took the stick and I put it over to the side of where the went hydraulics, and the airplane kind of righted itself. And I remember thinking, God didn't have anything to do with this. It was just my superior flying skills that I had this airplane. But then the airplane went back upside down, and I said, God, I didn't mean it. Didn't mean it. <laughs> well, we rolled the airplane, and finally got, I heard this loud bang. I didn't know the whole tail blew off of the airplane. Uh, and, you know, it went into a spin, and I could pull the drag chute to try and break the spin, and there was nothing. And I always told Willie, I said, Willie, if we're ever going to eject, I'm going to say, Willie, eject, eject, eject. And I only got Willie E in bed, and he was not. <laughs> <laughs> but coming down in a parachute, I made a vow to myself. I said, God, if you really exist, I promise you I'll find out if you exist or not. When I got into San Diego, I met a guy named Dan McKinnon. And a devout Christian, I raced motorcycle. He had a thousand acre ranch. And we went out and raced motorcycles all day long. And we came back and around a campfire. And one of the guys I was racing with, I'd never heard of, his name was Hal Lindsey. 
Al Lindsay, her late great planted there, saved his life. Well, he's, he's a minister up in Diamond Bar. And we sat around the campfire, and Dan broke out the Bible. And an uh, elderly man and woman walked up, drove up, and they walked down to the lake. And it was, it was uh, Billy Graham and Ruth Graham. And he was having a crusade tomorrow, the next day, and I told him that story. And so he had me go to the crusade, and he told the story, and we got a standing ovation. I went on two other crusades with him. But here I, I asked for help, and he sent it. Dan was also president of the Country Music Association, and I got to be on the old Ryman building with Johnny and June Carter Cash and Mom Maybell and the rest of them. They come and did fundraisers for me when I was in Congress. And uh, I stayed with Johnny for a whole week and June Carter. So then becoming a Christian has been like a sine wave. It's not just doesn't happen. I don't know about to do. But I want to tell you something. For you that uh, have had any problems or anything, if you lose a family member, a child, like these shootings in Texas that just happened, if you can imagine uh, not having your son or daughter come home from school, Again, but I want to tell you, if you get on your knees and you say a little prayer, he's going to listen. I'm going to open it up to questions. i got one more story I'll tell you later and stuff, but I'll answer any questions you have. Yes, sir. I have a cousin that was uh, one of the last gunfighters. He flew F-8, uh, F-8s. We already said when you're, F out of F when you're out of F-8s, it's no big deal. <laughs> well, he actually resigned his commission because back around 64, 65, the Navy kind of came out with a doctrine, no more dog fighting, you don't need it, you got missiles, no guns, none of that. Do you have stories that you can relate where you might have added to your tally if you'd had a gun solution available? Oh, yeah, on 10 May, I'd have two more bigs today. Um, William Van Bay, I got breakfast behind him, and I couldn't, he was too close, I couldn't show, I was going to try and back off. But then I got tracers. If I'd had a gun, and on that last kill as I'm going up, I'm only about six, seven hundred feet behind him, but I can't shoot my sidewinder. He would have gone out of the sky. Oh yeah. And it, it not just the gun doesn't just allow you to shoot somebody close in. When I got a big chase in my wingman, and he knows I got heat seekers, he could have tried and sit in as close to my wingman as he can, knowing that I can't shoot. If I've got a gun, he's got honor that as soon as I start closing, he's got a breaker, he's dead. So yeah, I've made a big, and I know a lot of other guys in the Air Force and the Navy too, uh, that it made a big difference for them. And the Air Force, I think the F-4E had a gun in it, 20 millimeter gun. And now, now today, they, uh, they listen to us, and the F-14, F-15, and F-16, and F-18 all have 20 millimeter guns. But yeah, it made a big difference. Yes, sir. That was one of the little plane captains that you got referred to as a crew chief on it for. And uh, we had two twenty threes on on ours on our bees. Okay, I have a little hard time hearing. It said we flew with two twenty threes on the on the sound line bees with the guy. But my question to you is, I don't know if you recall this. It's kind of like an old legend over there when I was there. Uh, North Vietnamese Air Force had a uh, colonel named Toon. Is that was that, never, you know, it was never... Is, it, is that real? Or? It was never verified. When I came back, they, I was pretty torn up. And I was down in, in my, uh, down in sick bay with the medics. My left knee had gone 90 degrees in the ejection and went back. This knee is replaced. Dislocated both my shoulders. My back was dislocated. And I'm down there and, and the Admiral came across. He changed his flag. And the reason he came is on my first kill, the press came out because no big had been shot down. And I said, Skipper, I don't want to talk to those fake news, <laughs> fake news uh, press. Because we had had a, a, a stir fly. We'd lost a, a, a guy on the flight deck. He went down an engine. And the captain took the ship out. We had barbecue. And the guys got grass skirts, hose, a hula skirts and stuff and were playing ukuleles. And here came the press and they took a picture of it. And one of the A7 drivers, they interviewed him, and 
They asked him, he said, how do you, Mr. Gorietti, what do you feel like, you know, flying over Vietnam? He said, hey, I'm flying a hot little jet, A7, and I'm pulling it around and I'm flying. Well, what they wrote was, here's an A7 driver that loved killing Vietnamese. And so I said, I'm not talking to those SOBs. And so the captain said, Press, get, get the hell off my boat. Well, after the second kill, they came, and I'm sitting up there on Lord 5, and they came in with their helicopters, and I called the captain, and I said, Captain, I don't want to talk to him. And he said, get the hell off my boat. Well, after this one, he came down when I was in the hospital, and he said, Duke, it's say lieutenant, he said, Duke, and he said, you know, congratulations. Uh, I said, but we want you to go to Hanoi, or not to Hanoi, <laughs> to Southern Hanoi. We want you to go to Saigon and, you know, talk to the press and stuff. And I, I started to say, Captain, you know, or Admiral, you know how I feel about the press. And he said, he said, Lieutenant, I highly, strongly recommend that you go. Now, if you're not, you know, a junior officer, you know what the hell he was telling me to do. Your, your butt's going. And so I said, when do I have to go? And he says, you hear that helicopter? That's your helicopter going in. Now, I couldn't hardly walk. My back was hurting so bad. And I went into um, the base. And when I got there, they took me up to a place that you guys are over there. You remember Blue Chip? Blue Chip is where the Air Force ran the war up there. Uh, there were more generals up there that I met. And I didn't even know they had that many and a couple admirals. And they took me aside and played a tape and they said, Duke, do you know who you shot down? I said, no. He said, it's a guy named Colonel Toon. I'd never heard of him. And then, so uh, that's where I got the information. But it was never verified. Although, remember I told you I just met with 12 Vietnamese pilots three months ago? They said, Duke, there was a Colonel Ton that you shot down. Mm -hmm. Verified. But, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter. Uh, they died and fought for their country just like we fought for ours. And some of them were good, some of them were. I'm just glad that I was able to come back and some of our other guys didn't. So that's all I know about the story. It was never verified that there was a Colonel Toon with 13 kills. How, how was the F-4 on the carrier? I mean, as far as the heavy airplane, is it? Was it Man, you know, the Phantom, it, she was a good lady. I mean, she did what she wanted. Landing it was okay. I hate it, but the guy that invented night carrier one of these ought to be shot. You know, coming aboard at the night and the deck is pitching and stuff. But it didn't have pretty good. The F-18 and F-14 is actually harder to land on a boat than the F-4. Huh? Uh, it's, you know, it sits here and does this doggy walk like this with those big wings and stuff. And your throttle response is like this with the Phantom. You know, you've got quite a bit of power range. But Phantom, she was a good lady. She treated us well. I got one last story for you. My dad, I had the best dad and mom in the whole world. And uh, I went in and uh, I lettered as a freshman in football, in track and basketball. I was made All-American in football and track as a sophomore in high school. But I am the world's worst baseball player. And we were out at the baseball diamond in Shell Biden. We didn't have one on base. It was out at the fairground. And I remember sitting on the bench. So you know how bad I was. I was sitting on the bench during practice. <laughs> and so I stood up and I took my ball glove and I threw it and I hit, I hit Coach Wetlatch in the chest with my ball glove. And I said, Coach, you're wasting my time. I'm out of here. So I rode my bike all the way back to my dad. And was at home. He's 6'2", a bike. He had arms like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I called him Sir, you know, to the day he died. And he said, Randy, thought you had baseball practice. And I said, Dad, coach will let me play, so I quit. And he said, he wanted to let me practice. And all he said was, Randy, get in the car. We started driving out toward the ball diamond, and I remember thinking, I don't want to see Coach Whitslides again. And we pulled up there, and I remember his words. He said, Coach, I'm not asking you to have my son play on the baseball team, but I'm asking, I'm begging you to let him back onto the team 
and finish out the season because quitting becomes a way of life, and I don't want my son to be a quitter. Now let's go to Pensacola, Florida, in class uh, 1367. We had just run a five mile cross country in Pensacola heat. We ran a second one in Pensacola heat. Probably half of the guys didn't make the second run. It was actually dangerous in dehydration and heat stroke. We got back and then we had to run the obstacle course. We got back to battalion one and Sergeant Walter, remember your drill sergeants? Sergeant Walter E. Taylor. I was a regimental commander. And I usually just stood in front of him and he looked at me and then we went and checked over the other 300 poofies in there. And so we, we did that and he says, you got five minutes for an RLP, room locker and personnel inspection. And uh, there's no way. Our, our khaki suits are so starched you can almost stand them up like a cork, cork piece of cardboard. You got all your brass, your belt buckle and your navy anchors that are on the desk and you spit shot in with brasso and you take toothbrush to make sure your skimmies are folded six by six and your socks are two by two. And so the sergeant said, you got five minutes for a room locker and personnel inspection. There's no way. I went running through the shower, took off all my sweaty stuff. I put on the, I put my brass on the collars and my belt buckle, I put it on the belt and it just went, you know, it sticks to it. It's like a, wetsuit and I went out and I'm ready for inspection and I never got in trouble because I was pretty squared away and Sergeant Taylor stood here and you don't eyeball the sergeant like this you kind of look up it's called eyeballing so I'm looking out this way and Sergeant Taylor got a quarter inch away from my nose and just started screaming I said what have I done wrong and in my haste the Navy anchor has a line running around it and that line is pointed outward. In my haste to come out for this inspection, I had crossed those with the bitter ends, they're called bitter ends, pointing inward. I spent another two hours running, singing what a bitter end my life is coming to, to the tune of You God Did. And Sergeant Taylor, Sergeant Bricker, and Sergeant Sanders would say, you're gonna quit cutting him? You're gonna DOR drop on request? And I said, no sir. I have a silver dollar in my back pocket that I'm going to spend because most of you know that the first non-commissioned officer to salute you after you become an officer and ensign, the only guy you have rank is a gate guard, but you're now an officer, that you hand him a silver dollar. And I reached in my back pocket and I, he said, show it to me. And I pulled it out and my dad had given me, this is not the original one, I had the original one framed, but he, uh, had given me this because over 50% of our guys quit flight training and quit. And he gave me this silver dollar to remind me not to quit. Newt Gingrich just got one of these. George Bush has one of these. I told him the story. Uh, three of the schools in San Diego give silver dollars to their student when they're freshmen and they have to have them when they're seniors. And an idea not to quit. Usually, I'll talk to a group like this and the silver, I'll find someone that's lost a child or fighting cancer or something like that. And I went to the Air Force Academy, Air Force Puke Academy, and there was a young lady here uh, that was a little overweight and she was thinking about uh, quitting the Air Force Academy and she didn't come to my talk. Well, her classmates took a silver dollar that I gave them to give to her and they told her the story Three years later, I got a letter and said, Dear Mr. Cunningham, I still have my silver dollar and I just graduated. Great. <laughs> That's all I got, unless you have questions. <laughs> yes? Did you uh, have a varying tactics that you had to use with the Big 21 versus the 17 with the performance differences? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Every airplane is different, whether in World War I, World War II, whatever. And that's where uh, the guys I had, and I had an old truck, and I had a gun sight set up in it. I had all my labs ready to direct switches come. I see an airline, I'd estimate the angles off and go through the switchology and everything, training myself. But I also studied every airplane. Like the MiG-17, I knew didn't have 
uh, high, hydraulically boosted controls because I flew against the MIG up at uh, the MIGs uh, up at Area 51, Tomahawk, before I went to Vietnam. And so I knew what they would do and what capabilities were doing. But the MIG-21, first of all, you wouldn't try and fight him above 20,000 feet. His wing was so good that he could outturn you up there, and even though a delta wing bleeds a lot of speed, as you get slow and he gets slow, you got a big advantage. The North Vietnamese, I told one of the generals that had five kills in the MiG-21, I said, you guys didn't fly the MiG-21 very well, because uh, I've flown the MiG-21, and if you get in close with Phantoms or even F-15s, he accelerates so good that you're going to be in trouble with him if you get in a real tight furball with him. They didn't fly the airplanes to the optimum like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a good airplane. It's small, hard to see, uh, but it has some disadvantages. It's very hard. To, this gun sight up here almost restricts your vision here. The thing they had to come over their head, I don't see it in this one, the little thing came over their head. Uh, it restricts your aft visibility, and its visibility is terrible. It's a hell of an airplane, both the 17 and the 21. They even taxi the thing with the brakes. Uh, they carried ATOL, which was not as good as our sidewinders. Uh, but they did have a 20 millimeter, I mean, uh, 23 millimeter, and a, the MiG-17 had 23 and a 37 millimeter cannon which looks like, you know, it's a low torch every, thing, every time that thing goes out, it goes boom, 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 up like that. But it's a big BB. Uh, MiG-17, his roll rate, we had a disengagement maneuver, his roll rate uh, is 137 degrees a second. So if you're here and you roll like this with a fan of 270 degrees a second, it takes him a while to turn that thing. You reverse it like this and you accelerate and try to, we call it MiG-17 disengagement maneuver. So the 17 had a roll rate problem. It had a non-hydraulically boosted control and visibility control. So each airplane, um, I told Nguyen Van Bay that was a MiG-17 driver, I said, if we flew it today one-on-one, -on -one, I said, I'd kill you in a MiG-17. And I said the same thing with MiG-21. Well, I said, when I was a member of Congress, uh, one of my uh, mates from San Diego, another member of Congress, he brought up three Russian astronaut, astronauts in the, right outside the House floor, and he said, Duke, these guys are astronauts and they used to fly the MiG-21. Sometimes, you know, they can tell you some things about MiG-21. And I've always thought Russian is not our friend, and I still think they are not our friends. They destroy us in a second if they could. So I looked at these three pilots and I said, I'll tell you something about MiG-21. They look great on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and I meant it. <laughs> yeah, each airplane you fly, it's like the flying tigers. You know, against the zeros, their tactic was to fly head on and take the hits, you know, head on with them because they couldn't turn with a zero. The uh, Air Force, or the British, had what they called VIC. Like this, they had three airplanes in the flight lead, did all the shooting, and these two guys kind of protected them. You're wasting two airplanes like that. The, uh, the Air Force and the thing, they had, you know, fluid four, and you had two flight leads and two wingmen to kind of protect them. We have one airplane, one airplane, and we may have a second section, but we maneuver independently, so we've got four airplanes fighting against whatever we have, not two. So, yeah, and through history, uh, there's been a lot of mistakes, and the Air Force guys during the war wouldn't let the Air Force fly to similar airplanes. They would fly Phantom against Phantom in training. And when they get against a tight turning mix, they get killed. And you saw when the POWs come back, a lot of them, you know, shut down, mix, shut down, mix, shut down, mix. They had a 2 to 1 kill ratio. We ended up with a 14 to 1 in 1972. And, but they established since their fighter weapons school, which is really awesome. They did something we didn't do. They incorporated their uh, air controllers in with the squadron, which was a great idea. So that we could become familiar with the voices and the calls and stuff. And they have a pretty good program. But you see today with all the shortcuts and everything, Air Force and Navy and Marine Corps are cutting back their adversary aircraft. Big mistake.
Yes, sir. What about your personality? They do uh, uh, willing to push the envelope within an inch of flying out of control to give you that success rate compared to any of the other pilots out there. You're more courageous, you're more brilliant, you just luck. No, I had to grow up flying model airplanes and we used to tie crepe paper out. We didn't have remote control, but we had a bunch, you know, strings. Yeah. And we would tie crepe paper on the airplane and we would dogfight and we had to cut the other guy's crepe paper off and he was dead sometimes we each other's airplane. And you know, I wanted to, to do that well. I made up my mind. I had all of you had different bosses that you worked for, whether in the Navy or not. Some of them were good and some of them were ugly. You know, they're not good bosses. I made up my mind to take all the things that I had liked about my skippers. And when I became commanding officer, like paying attention to my troops, meeting with them regularly, telling them what a good job they're doing, and thanking them for their efforts and stuff. Uh, and that was something in my own personality that I just said, hey, I want to be the best commanding officer that they've ever had. I had five women in my adversary squadron officers, and most of the women were assigned is push paperwork. I got them called in the back seat. Uh, we had a T-38 and an F-5 uh, two-seater. We had A-4 Skyhawks, and I got them trained in the back seat. And when we went over to the tax range in El Centro, they ran the, the, the intercepts for us. I wanted them, just like I wanted my own daughters, to be everything that they could be. I took a little hit when women's first started wanting to fly, and I supported it. I said, listen, the only person that ever blacked me out in an airplane was Debbie Geary, aerobatic airplane, and she did a regular loop like this, and she did an outside loop, and we finished that, and she snap rolled it and came up like this and pulled. I remember waking up in the airplane. You don't know where you are when you wake up. You're going to say, I'm in an airplane. <laughs> and I'm totally blacked out. And there are women, but I said, they've got to pass the same skills that we did. We had a, a F-14 pilot, a woman, that, uh, killed herself. You know, she came back in and she it had a single engine and she still tried to nurse it around to the carrier like this and she rolled it, went inverted and crashed. You've got to have the same capability for a woman that you're demanding of a men. That's why I don't want Marine Corps or Army with women in your foxhole. I'm sure there's GI Janes out there that can out run out, shoot, do everything with a Marine or something. But what happens is you have this influx and they start passing these people and you get people that are going to get your other these killed. But, yeah, so, but with flying, it's just like in a truck. I said, hey, I'm not competing for six gold medals in the Olympics. One of us is not going to make it. And I made up my mind, I said, no matter how hard I train, there's some other DRCPP, that's Dirty Rotten Communist Pinko Nationals, <laughs> that's uh, training as hard as I am. And I said, if I'm going to survive, I've got to push myself. And the guys on the ship, my own pilots, used to make fun because every day I'd sit up at the blackboard and I'd write MiG-21, MiG-17, MiG-19. What are their capabilities? What's their range? What is their weapons? What's the kind of, you know, I hated studying about ships you know, Kennedys and stuff the Russians in. But uh, that way, but they made fun of me, but they didn't make fun of me after the year. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. It's great to be back in Oklahoma. Yes, Elaine. I've come to Bellevue Hall while you were speaking. I apologize for not being able to come up today when he was called to Washington, D.C. And so he just said to tell you one thing. Six. <laughs> I got it. Chuck's a good guy. And I will tell you, Feinstein is a dickhead. <laughs> if you listen to him, Richie didn't have any of those kills. He did it all. And I looked at him and I said, get the hell away from me. But Chuck is a pretty smart guy. Feinstein was in my squad. Huh? He was in my squad. Was he? I don't know what you thought of him, but I thought no, he was no, just a Richie. prick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming.